Um, we are ready to start if you are. We have a quorum um, and I should begin by saying uh, I declare the meeting of the committee open and uh, that this is an extraordinary meeting, not only because it's the last committee meeting I will chair before the Deputy Lord Mayor takes over, um, but it is the first committee meeting to be uh, recorded and streamed for publishing to the internet. Uh, please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you will make you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside Australia. Where is the camera? Um, <laughs> Okay. Um, Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations present today. Apologies. Um, contrary to your agenda, Councillor Kouros is here. Councillor Donovan is not, and I understand we have an apology from Councillor Kira, who's unwell. Um, now, confirmation of the minutes. I'm assuming everybody has read the minutes, is happy with them. Could I have a mover? Uh, Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Moran. Um, those in favour? That's carried. Okay, let's move into the agenda and uh, the first item tonight is uh, item 4.1, unowned and semi-owned moggy management. Uh, and Vanessa is introducing the subject. Um, through the chair, I'm happy to take the paper as read. It's really just for noting for members. Okay, before I put the motion, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Rob? Thank you. Just a, a question about the um, engagement with the RSPCA on this. Um, I saw them flagged in the paperwork. Are you able to just talk to um, how what we're doing is consistent with the RSPCA's best practice? Uh, yes, through the chair. Um, basically, what we are doing is what the RSPCA recommends. So we've adopted their recommendations where they apply um, in terms of local government's role. So that's that's really what the report is noting that we're um, we've worked really closely to look at what their latest report says, and we're working with them. And that's why some of the um, sort of previous recommendations around or previous suggestions around. Um, uh, practices like um, track neuter return, those kinds of things, you'll see are not um, supported. not supported. So yeah, we're, it's really aligned to their views. Yeah. Any other questions? I have two brief ones. The paper uh, um, mentions but doesn't refer to uh, the location of a colony of unowned, unowned or semi-owned cats in the city of Adelaide. Where is it? Um, th through you. Um, it, I think the paper does mention it's in, um, near the corner of South Terrace and near Gilly Street. Oh, okay. And um, is it the intention that the uh, the lethal gel that's mentioned in there would be used? 
uh, because it does talk about a trial area in South Australia. Is that one of the trial areas? Uh, through the chair, I, I don't believe so. Um, given we only have one colony of this kind, I don't think that that would be something that we that would be necessary um, in the City of Adelaide jurisdiction. So, yeah, my understanding is that would be used here. I, I believe that's looking to be trialled in the in the Flinders Ranges. Um, and if it were to be used in the City of Adelaide, it would come to council. Um, I don't believe, no, no. So at the moment, um, the way we manage cats is through the dog and cat management plan. Um, so that doesn't require council approval, but it is, um, it is approved by the dog and cat management board. So anything that we do is in line with what the dog and cat management board require. Yeah, but I, I don't see that we would be needing to adopt that kind of intervention. We just don't have the issue that other council jurisdictions do. It's uh, just that there's nothing in the paper to show whether it, it discriminates between cats and other wildlife. It just says it's a lethal gel that I'll spread on fur leads to death. I'd have to take any further questions on that specific technique on, on notice and come back to you about how that's used and where it's planned, but we don't have any plans to use it. Can you just clarify for me, what's a semi-owned cat? Sort of a neglectful, <laughs> neglectful owners or? A, a semi-owned cat is one that doesn't really, doesn't really have an official owner, but it's probably, it's being cared for, being looked after by others. So it might be being fed by people, but they wouldn't necessarily um, say it had a home or say that they're owned. Yes, whereas unowned are what people would generally refer to as feral. Yeah, yeah, but the semi-owned ones can be quite um, hospitable to humans because people look after them. I'm happy to move as printed if that. Yes, yeah, sure. Seconded, please. Um, the Lord Mayor. Um, do you wish to speak to? No. <coughs> Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Uh, next item on the agenda is a sustainability incentive scheme review. And Ian wishes to speak to that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a uh, paper that's been brought in response to the workshop we held on the 5th of March this year. Um, and it's really about the sustainability incentive scheme and how we are seeking to make some tweaks to best align the investment in this program to some key objectives. There have been some changes in the marketplace around technology changes, there's been some changes of policy settings at the state government levels, which have, in our view, created some areas of duplication, which we're looking to remove. Uh, and we've taken on some of the feedback about relative emphasis of the program. So Michelle Image is here to talk about any specific issues that you may want to discuss. Okay, do any elected members have any questions? Okay, well, I'll look for a mover. Uh, Robin Ann. Um, um, look, thank you to administration for your work on this. Um, I recognise this takes into account all the feedback that was given at the last session that we had. Um, in particular, I'm pleased to see that uh, there will still be support provided for people on low incomes. Um, in terms of access to solar, which I think is important. I recognise that there are other schemes now in place um, in the market more broadly, but it's really good to see that there will still be um, support for concession holders and people on low incomes to um, allow them to transition to solar. Um, and I also think it's really exciting that there's going to be um, work done looking at uh, opportunities around strata um, and apartment complexes, which I think has been a gap um, in this area. We know that uh, a lot of people that live in um, these complexes don't necessarily have access to solar by virtue of the fact that they're in an apartment and you can't always plug in or, or install your own. Um, so I think that's uh, a really exciting area. Um, I, I know that as a result of some of these changes there will be slightly less money allocated um, as a whole, um, but I, I recognise that that's on the basis of the changed um, policy settings. So uh, on that basis, I'm uh, happy to support. Okay. 
Anybody else? Anybody else wish to speak to it? Uh, back to the mover. That really sums it up. Just thanks for all the work. I can tell it's been a big um, project, but um, I think, again, it's an example of Adelaide le really leading the way when it comes to um, greening, because we've been a long-term leader in this space. And in a way, we've kind of been a victim of our own success because other levels of government have now stepped in and um, have started doing this work. Um, so it makes sense that we review the, the policy settings. Um, and I think this strikes the right balance. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Next item is 4.3 Waste Management Services Briefing. That's actually a, a procedural um, mention uh, to hold the place in the agenda. It is actually uh, at 5.1 on the agenda, so we will pass over that and go to 4.4, which is Events and Festival Sponsorship Program Funding Recommendations. Uh, and I understand that Ian wants to say a few words. Yeah, thank you again, Chair. Um, as you can see, there's a fairly comprehensive piece of work in, uh, in these recommendations that we're bringing forward to you tonight. Um, this is a really popular program. As you can see, we've had 32 applications, valued at about $3.3 million for available funding with $1.7 million. So we're heavily oversubscribed, which is a good place to be in some ways because um, there's real demand for the program that we're running. There are a range of um, uh, recommendations in here, some for multi-year funding, um, some are based uh, on the history and applications we've received. We do have event guidelines, which uh, again are attached, that we assess these applications on. So it's a very thorough detailed process and um, Paula is here tonight just to talk through any queries you may have given um, the, the, the array of uh, applications that we have received. Uh, yes. Um, I, I just advise that I have an actual conflict um, with um, several of the um, uh, recommendations. Um, as such, I will um, choose to remain and participate in the debate, but I won't be voting. Um, similarly, I may have the same, so I might request that some items are dealt with in exclusion instead of all included together. If we can take it on parts. Well, now hang on. Um, you're supposed to declare also what your conflict is. I'm trying to find it. I'm guessing the Australian Aid Council. Oh, South. I'm not sure if it's in there. Not sure it's not. Okay. That's okay. No. I couldn't find it, so that's why. That's okay. I don't have one. That okay. Um, your conflict was yes, Chair, mine is with uh, 1.4, which is the other Fiscal Corporation. Um, 1.13. Yep. 1.14. Any other trust 1.17 and 1.18, which are all by the Adelaide Festival Centre Trust. Okay, that's quite a lot. I think that's it. <laughs> and then I, I, I probably have a um, perceived conflict of interest from several of the uh, events which I used to work for. So, and, and so you, you just won't vote at all, correct? Okay, okay um, questions. Yeah. Um, could, could you repeat what budget was and what we're, this is committing us to for this year? Well, I'll just get you to answer that total budget amount. Through the chair, the um, total sponsorship budget for this year to allocate to applicants is 1.712 million and the requests we received were 3.309 million this year. So what do you ask you to do? Approve it? Approve a threefold? No. No, no. no. Sorry, just to clarify. So the requests that we've received are just over the 1.7 million. Uh, sorry, that's the available budget we have, but we've had requests of 3.3, therefore we've, we've assessed them against the guidelines, and so our funding recommendation is to the 1.7 as per the budget. Um, I was just some context for councillors because this is, so a, this right, is it's it's a competitive right, process. So yeah. you're spending now, we're not like spending one cent over our allocated budget. Correct. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Sir. 
had a, a couple of questions specifically with regards to um, funding allocation for the China Chinese New Year. What did we fund last year? Um, I believe in that. Thirty grand. Through the chair, through the sponsorship program, we provided fifteen thousand dollars support. So yeah. that's what council endorsed at the same meeting. However, following that meeting, um, there was a motion on notice um, from the Chinatown Association requesting additional funds. So an additional 15,000 was found from the international relations budget. So the total council support was 30,000, but only 15 from the sponsorship budget. Because this is one of those um, things that is um, on repeat we're having every year. I believe every year for the last few years we've had to up the budget every time. Um, what's How is it assessed specifically? Um, is there an engagement process that you have with the applicant on their requirements or need for budget? What did they apply for initially? And, and how do you come to a, an assessment where 15,000 is the right amount? Or is it just a competitive process and it is what it is? It's a competitive process and unfortunately this application rated the lowest of all, so 18 out of 100. Okay. So it was quite underdeveloped, but um, you'll notice in the executive summary that there was a comment around um, the sponsorship program not really being designed to support small to medium multicultural events that are run by volunteers because the program is really for those medium to large scale events like Fringe and Adelaide Festival. So we're looking at other opportunities to fund these events in the future. So like a, a strategic style uh, partnership or multicultural style platform that could support those events as a separate criteria might something that council may need to consider in the future if we want to support them more. Or it could be another category within a, an existing program. For example, the Arts and Cultural Grants program has a number of categories. So we've already had discussions with them about what that might look like in the future because some events are currently support, some multicultural events rather, are currently supported through the arts and cultural program and some through here. So for consistency, it would be better to look at all of those events within the same funding category. Sure, oh, we only take questions at the stage. Thank you. Any more questions for Paula? Just, and then I take it that sort of, as the same with the Glindy Festival, in the same sort of vein. Um, look, I have a couple of questions, if no one else has another one. Um, we can't see what the uh, the funding is in the current year, so it's impossible to see whether there are cuts or increases in funding. Uh, can you tell us whether there are any cuts or increases to those ones which have been approved? Through you, um, there's a summary sheet that um, covers the attachment to the report, mm -hmm. which shows the previous year's funding Mm -hmm. um, and it also shows the average funding um, for those events that received um, funding for three years. So um, you'll notice that for an event, for example, Fringe, previous funding, so for um, this year's event, was 270,000. The average over the last year was 265 because the Fringe funding increased over the last triennial period. So the recommended funding for next financial year is 280,000. So that is a 15,000 increase on the average funding over the last three years. Okay, and my next question is around that as well. Um, the, uh, the papers, the administration supplied note that in 2016, council agreed to uh, annual CPI increases uh, for these initiatives, but that's not included in the three years going forward. Is that correct? Through you, the 2.5% increase in the sponsorship budget means that there's only um, 43,000 additional funds for next financial year. And we've received some new applications for new events. So it's not possible to apply that 2.5% increase to all events. So in effect, we're cutting back on the, the funding in real terms. We're cutting back on some events, some we're trying to maintain it based on the average over the last three years. Some have received a small increase and some a decrease in order to be able to support new events. And, and of the ones which have been decreased, which is the largest in dollar terms? 
the largest in dollar terms would be the Adelaide Festival, which is 20,000 decrease on the average over the last three years. Okay. Um, now I had other questions, but I saw the Lord Mayor wants to ask a question, so does Mary. Sorry, Chair, I just wanted to declare that I actually have a seed conflict of interest for, I just realised that Adelaide Horse Trials is on there, I'm on the board. So I'd like to um, vote, but can we take it out in parts and not vote on that one? Um, oh, we can do it. It's a very long process, but yes, we can do it in parts. Yeah. I beg your pardon. Oh, actual. Sorry. Actual. Sorry. Sorry. So, Mary, you're saying you have an actual, not yes. perceived conflict? Yeah, not perceived, actual. Actual, and the Lord Mayor is wishing to ask a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's just a couple of events uh, which I've got the table up in front of me, but I was just in terms of uh, uh, Tanansi um, Art Fair and also Opera in the Park. Um, given that their rating was higher than some of them, some of the ones that we did fund, could you just um, give us a little bit of explanation as to why they weren't funded? Through the chair, I just need a second just to get my pages on. The art fair and opera events were the smallest in terms of scale, attracting about the same number of attendees. The art fair um, is an application that we haven't received previously dedicated to the art fair. We've previously received an application from the art gallery for the overarching Tarnandi Festival. So this application was just positioned for the art fair. So compared to previous years, the um, score that they received was much lower than two years ago. Um, and the opera event um, is a new event, but the proposed use of funding to live stream the event into regional centres and to cover free tickets for students and children was deemed not an appropriate use of funds. So we weren't able to support those events. Um, and in respect of the Adelaide Film Festival and the French Festival, there's one year's funding only in there. Is that because there's an expectation there'll only be one more of each of those in the funding period? Through you, the Adelaide Film Festival is a biennial event, so they are recommended funding for year two out of the three year pre-commitments. So they don't have two events that fall within this triennial period. And for the Adelaide French Festival, I guess it's a similar situation to Glendy and Lunar New Year in that we're looking at other ways to support multicultural events moving forward. So small to medium scale multicultural events have been recommended for one year funding. Okay, and just one final question. What is the Adelaide Food Fringe and why are we giving it $62,000 for the next three years? <coughs> Through you, the Adelaide Food Fringe is a new event. Um, the concept is based on the Fringe model where it's an open access event. So the organisers themselves will run um, a couple of events, so an opening and closing event, and then they will um, create an online platform so anyone and anyone and everyone can register an event to, to be involved. So um, the recommended funding is to help establish this new event to the city because it provides an excellent opportunity for engagement of city businesses. And it's worth noting that this was, given that this event hasn't been held previously, it was very well thought out. Um, and council funds would allow the festival to establish a proof of concept so council funding would be in, used to employ staff and assist with marketing and contribute to the opening night event. And the applicant is also proposing that they could use part of council funds as an incentive to attract businesses to get involved and cover their registration fees. Um, so the idea with this event is that it happens after Tasting Australia and it's a more affordable option for people to get involved in a, um, an event that showcases <coughs> South Australian produce. 
Um, they're proposing some key elements. So the idea would be that people can register to be part of these different aspects of the event. So for example, a Parklands Olive Grove event, um, a gourmet grandma's event, multicultural food hubs, bake-offs, cook-offs, brew-offs, um, a People's Choice Food Awards event in the town hall, um, and a fringe food food fringe rather podcast. That sounds exciting. Um, uh, can I ask who the uh, the organizer is? Is are they associated with the existing fringe or a completely new party? The applicant is yet to establish a eligible organisation, so conditions of their funding um, would be for them to register a non-for-profit or other um, eligible organisation. Um, the applicant is um, a um, experienced event organiser and has got buy-in from other producers and event organisers who've already suggested that they would be involved in the event should this application be successful in receiving funding. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I have a mover somewhere? Simon, I wasn't quite sure. Um, Rob? Um, so, sum up. I know you can't sum up. Yeah, but... I think there should be a new rule. <laughs> <laughs> what did you ask? You asked me to move, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a rule, but... Okay. Rob? Anyone else wish to speak? Council Yes. Or just Council Oh, yes. Um, yeah, you can call me that. Um, no, hang on. So, if people want to speak, they can speak broadly. Then no, I can put those questions. Yeah. Okay. Can I have um, just a, a procedural word? Because of the conflicts here, um, the Lord Mayor is not voting on anything. Councillor Kuros um, has a conflict with 1.15. Can I suggest, um, Simon, that you move everything except 1.15, which we'll move separately? Yes? Okay. I'm, I'm assuming you're still not saying anything. Understand that. And I'm happy with that there. You're not saying anything? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else saying anything? No, that sounds good. Okay. Um, all right then. Um, uh, back to the mover, and for the sake of clarity, um, we are moving all of the items uh, in 4.4 except for 1.15. Those in favour? No, you can't vote. Oh, oh, yes, you can. Yeah. can. <laughs> Sorry, I'm confused. I'm confused. Yeah, so that's carried. Yeah. Now we move 1.15. I move 1.15 sprinting. Second. Well, second in demand. Um, those in favour? Those against? That's carried. <laughs> okay, next item on the agenda is 4.5, which is the annual review of delegations. And Rudy wanted to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. Through the Chair, this is a procedural report which comes to committee and council every year um, because of the local government requirement to do an annual review of the delegations. So council has various powers and functions under various legislation and this report basically is about the review of the delegations given uh, in relation to these uh, various acts. Um, the team is available tonight if there were to be any questions on this, so otherwise, um, yeah, I'm taking this printed and happy to take uh, questions. Are there any questions related to the annual review of delegations? No. May I have a mover other than Rob? That's a good question. Oh, question? Um, just one of the things that I did ask earlier was with regards to delegated authority to the CEO around um, 
budget allocation and expenditures, is that still sitting at the 4 million plus CPI or? Um, you might remember the CEO uh, made that change himself yep. and brought that into the, uh, into the council. So it's um, 1 million and anything over 1 million is, um, will be considered by council. All right, perfect. That's all I wanted to check. Thank you very much. <coughs> and that's in line with state government delegations, I believe, probably. Consistent. Also noting um, through the chair that this is a financial delegation that you're referring to. Yeah. These are uh, delegations under legislation. Any other questions? Move on. <laughs> Rob is always first. Seconded by Anne, who's always second. Um, would you like to speak? I'll reserve my right. Anyone else wish to speak? Some. Let's put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Okay, we move on. Item 4.6, Integrated Business Plan, Review of General Operations Fees and Charges. And uh, Tracy is going to speak to us or just answer questions. I can speak very quickly, if you like. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, through the chair, thank you. Um, after many months um, of hard work by elected members and administration, <laughs> we're nearing the end um, of our integrated business plan and budget for um, approval for 1920. So it's quite an exciting night for tonight and next Tuesday. Um, so um, there's a series of reports um, that we were our approval um, through to council for next week. Um, the first one is around um, operational fees and charges for council and RMA. Okay, any questions? Um, I just have one question. We have 14 new fees being levied, um, which is for a red tape cutting council a sensational thing. Are they associated one, with one particular action or a series of actions? Uh, through the chair, they're predominantly related to the fact that uh, we've got some new fees from relation to encroachments. And so uh, they're in line with what was adopted at council on the 23rd, sorry, the 26th of March earlier this year. Okay, um, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and on those encroachments, even though they are all stated as new, but there was a fee in the 1819 year as well as the 1920. Is that because of the adoption? Yes, through the Chair, uh, that reflects the fee that was adopted on the 26th of March. Uh, there were pre-existing fees prior to that, uh, but the schedule only refers to the new fee schedule. And um, just one thing that I thought was curious, there's a, um, at page 468 it says there's a publication entitled Those Turbulent Years, which I'm guessing is not about this council, although it could be, I suppose. Um, and we've reduced the cost by 100%. Um, does that mean it's free and where is it available? Through the chair. Apologies. Uh, through the chair, I'll take that one on notice, please. Uh, through the presiding member, um, that would be a publication. Um, I'd say we've run out of copies. Um, so usually our archives have a um, keep a copy for archival history, um, but there were copies available for people to purchase. So I can certainly follow up and just check that. That's where you're getting all your ideas from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 about, it's free, but it's unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I have a move? France, Mary, second. France. Mary. Um, does anyone else wish to speak to it? Rams? Those in favour? Those against? It's carried. Um, item 4.7, Rundle Hall Management Plan. And 
Tracy is again. <coughs> Sorry, Chair, could you give us the page number? Sorry, Chair. 497. Well done, sir. 497. Yeah. So, what's the page? Uh, through, the, uh, through the Chair, um, this is uh, in accordance with RMA's Charter and the Local Government Act, um, the Annual Business Plan and Budget for 2019-20. Um, in summary, it's a balanced budget with revenue of $4.4 million. Are there any questions related to the Rundle Wall Management Authority? Okay, can I have a mover? Deputy Lord Mayor, and do you wish to speak to it? No, I don't. Thank you, Chair. And? No, thank you. Okay, does anyone else wish to speak to it? Back to the mover. Stand up. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Um, next item is the central market, uh, which is 4.8, again to be introduced by Tracy. Um, through the Chair, um, in accordance with ACMA's charter and its strategic plan, we have ACMA's integrated business plan for 2019-20, um, which has both its operating budget and the capital expenditure of $3.3 million. Any questions? Lord Mayor. Little waver yeah. thing. <laughs> um, if I could just ask in terms of item, uh, it's number six in the report, which talks about 3.3 million to be funded through a loan from the City of Adelaide. Um, can I check A, if that 3.3 million is in our budget? And also, is because it's called a loan, is this, Repaid or is it just a loan? As in, um, so, um, so uh, through the um, chair, and uh, that's correct, it is uh, classified as a loan. Um, as with previous capital expenditure um, provided to ACMA, it is a loan from the City of Adelaide to our subsidiary. Um, when we consolidate our financial statements, it um, disappears because we're one institution. Um, however, um, it is classified as a long-term loan um, because there's no repayments identified in the 10-year strategic plan for a 10-year business plan for them. It doesn't show any repayments coming off. For the purposes of financial statements, uh, we um, have an implied interest cost for that loan, which again disappears on consolidation with our financial statements. Um, we were um, we, we are sort of a little bit in limbo until the charter is reviewed for, for ACMA as to what is happening with that infrastructure item. So um, we sort of don't have a position yet on, on moving forward for that. Um, the second response in do we have the 3.3 million in our budget, we do, um, it shows under the line that's called subsidiaries and you'll see there's an item there for $3.3 million. I have a question related to that too. So notionally it appears um, on the market's balance sheet that there is an interest payment that's due to council, is that correct? Notionally. Notionally, yeah. And so notionally that affects the trading position of the central market. Um, they actually don't pay, repay any interest expense to us, but when we um, do our financial statements at the end of the year, we have to reflect that there is a loan and we have to reflect that there is implied interest costs in that. But because we are one entity, when we consolidate the financial statements, the two items offset each other. And, and that's a, a reasonable practice, I think. It is an approved practice. Um, what's reasonable in terms of uh, the repayment of the loan is difficult to answer because it depends on whether long-term council sees that infrastructure item sitting uh, in with central market or it sees that it should be part of council. So until that's determined, I, I, I can't answer what the position should be. And the council will be asked to consider that at some stage. And it's part of the charter discussion. Um, I'm not sure what that's happening. Thank you. Any other questions? May I have a mover, please? Tracy? No, sorry. <laughs> Rob? <laughs> uh, Mary? <laughs> Rob? Mary? No. Anyone else wish to speak to this? Yes, Anne. I'm not happy about the central market putting his hand out for more money. 
uh, in that line. Um, we give them the, we ran the market when we ran it, with the rental only, and they have the car park revenue um, and the authority cost is I think $40 million a year to run. I, I have always opposed this, outsourcing, and now I seem to best, I, I accept that it's an acceptable way to to behave as a subsidiary is supposed to be separate from council and self funding, and it clearly isn't. So I'll be voting against it. Anybody else? Look, I. Just. Yep. Sorry. No, no, I'm Lord happy Lord for you or the Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. Look, I. I um, I'm assuming that when the charter comes in for review, we're going to have a little bit more time to look through these budgets because um, just going to what Council Moran said, uh, I, I did look through the figures and they, they get an income from um, uh, from the traders uh, and the leases of you know, 4, 4, 4.8 million, uh, but we take back in fees 30% in rent, which is 2.9 plus another 1.9 million in terms of car parking fees. So we actually take back more than they earn through the car park um, by a tiny bit, by about $50,000, I think. Um, but it's, uh, it, it is one of those things which I'm hoping will come into the review in terms of how uh, how that goes forward in terms of the income and their ability to be able to do any capital infrastructure. Um, just to the chair, I might just answer that. With the changes internally, the uh, subsidiaries are reporting into the growth portfolio. Um, so we, um, just being honest with you around reflecting on some of the changes that are going on in the ACMA um, charter review has been uh, an ongoing piece of work. Um, so to the question, absolutely yes, we need to be looking at uh, how it's funded, what's sustainable, what are the crossovers between ourselves and the subsidiary. Um, and I think the additional piece of work that we'll be looking at too will be as we move into the next phase, the central market arcade and what the overall operating model is. So there's a, there's a lot of work to do around um, ironing some of those things out. Deputy Lord Mayor. Look, just a couple of things. I do support um, this level of um, expenditure around the budget. The one thing that I want to sort of remind elected members of, um, in essence, the council has handed over uh, an asset that was not up to speed to the Central Market Management Authority for Management. And this is the challenge that we all need to accept. Uh, and this is why, as a result, with a operation that is not able to fund CapEx, uh, the Central Market's having to come back to council, which is the landlord. And if you are a landlord of any site, there's an expectation for you as a landlord to make sure that the building's in a safe condition, this, the building is in operable condition for its tenants, and thus is why we're having to expend some of the money over and above. I do take note uh, that the intention of council, as Councillor Moran said before, was that with the provision of parking as an asset, as a business, there was an expectation that the central market could be afloat to manage its own capital works. But what councillors didn't know at the time uh, is that 30% of every dollar coming through any revenue for the market, and I mean every single revenue for the market, is clipped at 30%. Every single revenue. If the market sells a book, even if it costs them money, it's clipped at 30%. I mean, this is what we need to understand as a council. And this is why I asked this question a few months back. We need to understand um, as a, uh, we, we need to create a public position that's very clear as a council, whether we want to treat the central market as a commercial asset or as a community asset, because the answer to both of those through a charter discussion uh, will deliver on different outcomes for the community and different outcomes for the traders. Um, so these are all the things we need to keep in mind. We do have an asset um, that is falling behind. It's not acceptable to have that asset fall behind. So if we are expecting uh, those tenants to be paying premium rent, which they are in that space, then there's an expectation uh, that the asset is in good nick um, and there's an expectation of the market to do that. And I'm, I'm not saying that there is no blame on the Central Market Management Authority either. I think, you know, we can all do our job better. Uh, but I think it's really important to note that moving forward, I think, especially with the Central Market Arcade, uh, arcade development coming in, we need to be cognizant of what, what the next two years look like and the impact that that would have on our on our traders and ratepayers in the area as a whole. Um, and look, with that in mind, uh, I think if there's an opportunity to discuss the new charter and the new vision to what that looks like for the central market, 
I think that will resolve a lot of our issues um, as we uh, as we keep going ahead with this. So look, for now, I think uh, we need to operate over the next two years uh, with very open eyes uh, and really look closely at the impact of that central market arcade development as well, because it will have an impact on the car park and on the traders. And it's our responsibility to make sure that that area is maintained uh, and that we have a good process in place, which I believe is becoming soon, uh, for us to, to manage uh, that process, to manage that asset um, as well. So, but otherwise, I'd, uh, I'd support this or recommend this for council at this stage. Rob, <coughs> I'm sure if anyone else wanted to speak first, because I was going to sum up. All oh, right. Yeah. Look, I just uh, wanted to say a brief word. I, I actually share some of the concerns of Councillor Moran. I am a great supporter of the central market. I think it's a, a great asset uh, to, to this uh, council and to the city. Um, however, um, there are serious questions, as uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor points out. Um, as a member of the board of um, uh, the Central Market Authority, he would be aware that the likelihood is that in the coming years, with construction underway of the Central Market Arcade, the revamped Central Market Arcade, uh, there will be impacts on the Central Market. And we have here a position where an organisation is uh, presenting a balanced budget, um, but we're forgiving interest on a $3 million loan in a way that um, we wouldn't do with other assets. And indeed, we've had some, some very spirited debates about even spending a few million, million dollars on uh, other assets like the Aquatic Centre, which is a community asset. Um, and, and uh, I'm not sure I regard the central market as a community asset. If it did, it might be in trouble. But um, as a business, um, it, it is a cause for concern. And I am troubled. I will vote for it, but I am troubled. Rob. Thank you, Chair. Look, I, um, I do understand the concerns that have been expressed by Councillor Moran and yourself. Um, but look, I don't share them. Um, I think we um, get a good bang from our buck, for our buck in terms of our investment in the central market. Um, whilst it may not be a community service as such, I see the central market as being a community icon, if I can use that term. Um, it is at the centre of um, our uh, food district, you know, being along Guja Street. Um, it brings in tourists into um, the city. It's used by a lot of our residents and I think it is a big part of the cultural experience of living in Adelaide and in fact our central market has won world acclaim recognised internationally as being something that is a really unique world-class central market. So on that basis while I do understand that the concerns around us constantly uh, giving handouts I do think it's an appropriate investment for the council to make, and I know that it is in effect a loan as well. So I think we get good bang for our buck in terms of um, that investment, and that it's worthwhile us doing it. Those in favour? Those against? That motion is carried. Um, next item tonight is 4.9, um, the integrated business plan, and I understand Tracy is speaking to that as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, so through Chair, um, this is the City of Adelaide's 2019-20 uh, integrated business plan. Um, most of it is unchanged from the last time we brought this forward to you. Um, with the um, main adjustments that we've also discussed with you before is the five million timing in relation to a state government grant which has been brought into 1819 instead of 1920. It doesn't change our overall cash flow position. The um, $200,000 um, adjustment to our rates um, and um, the expenditure of that on the change in recyclable costs and the uh, $15,000 um, adjustment, which was approved by Council last week in relation to the Albert Bell Tower and uh, documentation. Are there any questions? Questions? Yep. Um, Rob? Deputy Lord Mayor? No? Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I was in the middle of finding it and my document has collapsed. Um, so I can't pull up the, uh, the exact page. But um, a little while ago, when we had some discussions around the budget, I uh, expressed some concern around 
um, whether uh, in effect not increasing the rates would impact on service delivery and um, you know, staffing numbers and also whether there were certain services that we offered whether they would be done differently because of um, that. Um, and I think there was an undertaking given, undertaking given at the time that there would be some more information brought back, but I, I don't know that that has happened. And I just wondered whether you were able to let me know what the outcome was of those investigations in terms of impact on service delivery um, and, uh, and staffing under this new um, budget. Um, I think Claire was acting CEO once. That's it. Um, thank you. I think at the time um, and there was a follow-up um, e-news um, clarifying um, that there hadn't been any impacts to services. However, as a result of um, many inquiries from council members, you'll remember um, the CEO has committed to bringing through to you starting in July, so very soon, um, a service by service um, analysis of all the suite of current council service offerings um, and do that in an integrated way so you have full visibility of our current service services FTUs um, and what gets delivered for those services. So that will start to progress um, next financial year. And Acting CEO, can I just clarify, will that be in effect kind of a, a rationalisation process of saying, you know, are there savings that can be made, are there some roles that can be rolled into one or is it going to be more of an update? Um, I think that's up to council members. Um, so, uh, you know, you may well think um, that we're over-servicing or under-servicing in certain areas. So what we'd like to do is be able to have that conversation with you in the context of all our general operating services. Um, so that's the intention of, of that um, rolling program. But, but there are no uh, cuts to services um, or staff in this coming round as a result of this budget? No, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Just uh, double checking, um, so I can manage any conflict. Uh, I'm sorry, Chair, just with regards to the Australian Day Council. Is that embedded somewhere in that document? And if it is, if yes, I could. Yes, it is. Um, so the member, yes, it is. It's yeah. under strategic partnership. Sure. So we just need to. Um, so just a question through you, Chair, to Administration, potentially Rudy, uh, as a council proxy on that board, uh, I believe that's a perceived conflict because of, as a proxy, not an actual independent. A proxy on the board, you say you're uh, um, on the board as a... As a proxy of the City of Adelaide. Representative. All right. At this point in time, that would then be an actual conflict of interest. Yeah. It's still subject to council decision. Sure. And then when it comes into council, um, you may turn your mind to a material conflict of interest. Okay, so I'll declare a, an actual conflict and I will um, I'll probably, um, I'll ask the Chair if that could be, if I'm not sure if there's any others that are potentially a conflict, and ask for that item to be omitted from the agenda uh, and I would not be voting uh, on that item. Omitted from the agenda or well, simply? Omitted from the initial move of the motion. So whoever moves the motion to endorse this budget to <coughs> take it in parts. Basically. So no, that's right, you want it in parts. So um, the first part is as proposed and the second part will be as proposed, uh, sorry, plus, what part is it? What's the? Uh, Australia Day and the City. Uh, what's the budget number? Is there another next to it? Page 36. Yep. There's no number or anything. It's under creative. And page 36. Page 608. 608 of your electronic agenda. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the one hundred and seventy thousand dollar line. Okay, so except allocation for Australia Day. And Chair will also declare a conflict as well. I'm a, I'm a I'm a board member. I'm hang on, hang on, hang on. So you have the same conflict. And you have the same conflict? I'm not convincing her. 
Okay, so do I. I have uh, a convention bureau policy. Uh, hang on. <laughs> hang on. <laughs> 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 uh, no, no, we've never had this many conferences. <laughs> the law has changed recently. So, um, where is that allocation? 373. 373,000. Okay. I'm trying to remember all that. Um, any other conflicts while we're here? Yes, Thank you, Chair. Uh, the same conflict as was in um, item 4.4 in terms of events and festival sponsorships. And I'm just looking for the item number. Uh, it doesn't have one. It's on page 608 and it's 1.941. Okay. I just want to see if there's any others. Um, sorry, Chair. Okay, so on six oh so six oh eight. Well just six oh eight? Yeah, on page six oh eight. Um which is the festival and event sponsorship program. 1.941. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> and so it's just, any it's just here or anything else? No, okay. Just a question to administration chair. Is um app for remuneration anywhere in this item? Oh, I you consider because if it is, then I do. If it isn't, then I don't. Streets. Uh, through the chair, Rudy, I'll take advice from you, but that budget's been approved separately. Uh, it is within the consolidated figures, but I think as that budget's been approved separately, that's probably not an issue. Uh, that is that one. Yes. Rudy? Rudy? Yeah, in that case, the ordinary business exemption would apply, so matters that have been discussed at a subsidiary, uh, ordinary business exemption applies if anything comes to the committee or the council subsequently. Okay. Any more conflicts perceived, actual, troubling ones, late ones? <laughs> um, okay. Are there any further questions before we move to the uh, the motion? Are we taking in parts? Sorry. Yes, I'll have to take it in parts. So the first part, when it comes, will include everything but one. Two and three, and then we'll do two, one, two, and three. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, through the chair. Um, as you know, the conflict of interest provisions are quite complex. Um, I've just looked up in the Act. Um, the actual conflicts of interest a member of a council will not be regarded as having a conflict of interest in a matter to be discussed at a meeting of council by only reason of nomination or appointment as a member of a board or corporation or other association if the member was nominated for appointment by the council. So if your board membership is a result of a direct appointment by the council, that absolves this um, actual conflict of interest oh, on, this matter. <laughs> on, on this matter. Yes, yeah, Sheriff. Sure. I'm, I'm on the uh, I'm on the Australian Day Council board uh, in my own. Yeah, so uh, I'm in, I'm there um, in a personal capacity. Okay. So I, I do have a conflict. So really, if I'm correct, we've revised it now, and so we can have a vote on all but the Australia Day Council. No, I'm on the Lord Mayor too. So and again, I'm on the Film Festival board in my. I'm not as a So the 1.941 million applies to you? Because there is the film festival. So we've got two. Got that? Okay. Um, just to give everyone a chance, are we all comfortable with our conflicts? Yep. Okay. No. You've got one too? No, not at all. I was just saying I have to move across sections and you said to go. Okay. Um, no, you were going to move a variation. Uh, no. <laughs> you know? No. Okay. Okay. On the uh, the road. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Moved um, by Rob, seconded by Anne. Um, discussion. No. Yep. 
it's um, more of a comment here. I just want to thank the team. It's been a uh, very long journey on this budget and uh, it's been a huge amount of work. I just want to thank you and your team for uh, answering our um, many, many and varied questions um, and uh, uh, look forward to seeing all these projects uh, take place. Okay, um, I just wanted to say, um, and I had hoped it might have been moved by someone, but I'm um, disappointed still that there's an allocation in there which is noted for the council to pay three quarters of a million dollars um, for a roadway in the parklands to the Adelaide High School, which will be used by Park 24 users, um, without having asked the state government to contribute anything through either the education department or through the school's budget. And moreover, the road is being contributed with a kiss and drop zone, while the other two entrances and exits to the school remain open. Um, it should have been, in my view, negotiated rather than just immediately agreed. Okay, back to the mover. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like the Lord Mayor want to acknowledge uh, the work that's gone into uh, this. It has been a long um, process, um, but I'm particularly pleased um, that we've been able to resolve a few issues as well, think, things like the community bus. Um, an ongoing commitment and um, a range of other measures as well. So, um, yeah, thanks everybody for your work. Okay, now I'm just taking advice here. Yep. Okay, so for the, um, the sake of clarity, we are moving as printed, except for the reference to the Australia Day event and funding of $175,000 and with the exception of the $1.941 million that the Lord Mayor identified as events and festival uh, funding for which she has a conflict. Um, sorry Chair, it only has to be the funding for the film festival. Only for the film festival? Okay, well hang on, we'll have to go and look that up. I think it's, it's $40,000, isn't it? Remember? Uh, we have to go back to that item, I'm sorry. Well, look, how about we say it's 40000 and then we can fix the minutes um, by agreement at the end of the event. Okay, so I'm moving as printed, except for the $175,000 allocation for the Australia Day event because of Amman's conflict. And we are excluding also the $40,000 funding for the Adelaide, uh, not moving also, the $40,000 funding for the Adelaide Film Festival in consideration of the Lord Mayor's conflict. Is everyone clear about that? Those in favor? Those against? That's carried. I'm now going to move that we approve the $175,000 allocation for the Australia Day Council. You're not voting. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Sorry to be a pain, but did you have a mover and second that? Oh. Detail, detail. <laughs> um, Happy to move. Moved, seconded. Okay. Um, I'm assuming there's no conversation required around this. It's just procedural. Okay. Um, the $175,000 for the Australia Day event, excluding Aman. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. And I need a mover then for the funding for $40,000. Okay. Um, for the Adelaide Film Festival, that does not include the Lord Mayor. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we are now to adoption of motions. We all clear? Yes. The moment we just we are. Okay. We now move to item four point one zero adoption of valuations, which is procedural more than anything else. Tracy, do you wish to speak to it? Mover, moved by Anne, seconded by Mary. 
Um, do you wish to speak? No, I accept the procedure. Um, okay, we'll put it to the vote. Those against? That's carried. Um, declaration of rates. Um, item 4.11. Tracy again to speak if she wishes. So moved. moved by Anne, seconded by Franz. Um, do you wish to speak? I do not. Franz, do you wish to speak? No. Um, anybody else? Okay, back to the mover. Sound up. Those in favour? Those against? <laughs> Hang on, is that an, an against? Can we have an against? Oh, right. Uh, that's carried. Okay, next item is 4.12, which is Declaration of Rundle Mall Separate Rate. Again, procedural. Moved by Anne, seconded by Simon. Um, do you wish to speak to it? No. Okay. Um, in which case, I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. 4.13. Okay. We now move to item 4.13, which is recommendations for grants to the Budgets for Community Development, Arts, Cultural, Recreation uh, and Sport to be introduced by Claire. Well, thank you, Chair. Well, I think you've introduced it nicely. It's for those three ongoing uh, <coughs> programs that uh, the paper sets out, um, the recommendations associated with those three areas. Uh, <laughs> I know that you've got your hand in the air. Are there any questions that people wish to ask? Um, yes. Uh, at the criteria of the Hutt Street Centre, um, it's understood that the Hutt Street Centre is $8 million unspent in its bank account. What exactly are we giving $50,000 for? Is there any specific... Um, I mean, I'd rather give it to somebody that didn't have $8 million. <laughs> is there any rationale? Acting CEO. Are you just being kind? Um, no, not just being kind, Councillor Moran. Um, so page 659 sets out the rationale mm -hmm. um, for uh, recommending the Hutt Street Centre um, receive funding through the community development grants. Um, it was a strong application um, and it ranked highly. And what was the programme? Through the presiding member, it's pathways to well-being, engagement and connection. Provide opportunities for um, volunteering and community programs for people experiencing um, homelessness. I'm just uh, moving on that. I, I won't vote against it, um, but that is the general purpose of the Hutt Street Centre. It's not actually a separate program at all. Um, and I really think when an um, a, a aid agency is so well funded, although it sounds good to give $50,000, there are other um, agencies here that do not have $8 million in the bank and could do with that money. I don't know why the Hutt Street Centre is so uh, wealthy. Um, and I don't really see any rationale for giving $50,000. i would rather give it to uh, one that like House. Well, hang on, we will come to the part where we can all speak. We're just dealing with questions. Oh, sorry. Um, any other questions? Okay, now I have an anxious hand in the air over there. Thanks, Chair. Moving is printed. No, I wanted to move a variation, um, and that is with an addition of uh, 1.16. Um, adding in the Adelaide Day Centre for homeless persons up to $35,000 a year over three years with years two and three to be subject to uh, meeting the criteria. The administration's criteria? Yes. Or, okay, administration's criteria. 
happy to send you Okay, well, hang on, we'll wait till we get the, the motion up there and I'll come to you to see. Over, over three years to be funded from the quick response budget in 2018-19. With years two and three subject to meeting administration's criteria. With years two and three. Funded by any. Years two and three funding, depending on. Depending on? Or contingent on meeting contingent administration's on. criteria. Contingent on meeting administration's criteria. Are you happy with that? Okay. Now, um, the Deputy Lord Mayor says he wants to second that. Is that correct? I've got a few questions, though. I'm happy to second it. <coughs> Can I speak to the motion? I'll explain the rationale. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thanks, um, Chair. Look, the reason I, I'm putting this uh, forward is um, I was concerned to note that the Adelaide Day Centre um, has not been included in um, the uh, grants this time round. Um, for those who are not familiar with the centre, it is unique in Adelaide in that it provides um, a range of services to uh, homeless persons in the city. But it's different from other um, organisations in that it also provides opportunities for people to engage in things like community gardening, um, arts and crafts. They run a, a store um, and the money generated is put back into the organisation. They also run a soup kitchen, which I understand um, has been very well frequented, particularly at the moment, um, has up to 70 odd people that come and visit it. Um, and uh, I understand that over the long weekend they had up to 80 people um, come to access the soup kitchen during winter. So it's an important organisation. It's one that the council has had a long term relationship with. Um, I understand that uh, from discussions I've had with administration and the, the concerns are expressed within the report that they didn't meet or weren't seen to have met some of the criteria. Um, and that's why I propose that we give them a, a what is in effect a special one-off grant from the quick response um, budget in recognition of the good work that they do. But then to get fundings in years two and three, they need to meet administration's criteria. And um, obviously there needs to be some work done with them to make sure that that, that happens. But it struck me as concerning if we don't fund this organisation this year, given the big focus this council has had on homelessness, um, the crisis that's been recognised by the council um, and the need for uh, us to do what we can to support vulnerable people in the city. So that's my rationale for putting this forward. Now, the second I had some questions. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Councillor Sims, for moving this. Um, look, the main question really relates um, through you, Chair, to the administration around to why did we recommend not to fund? And I believe it had something to do with um, from an administrative perspective, I think something was, was missing from the advice I received today. I just want to understand a little bit more about why and, and how the administration come to that decision and is it something that we could potentially help? Is it an administrative issue or is it an issue to do with the application or what is it exactly? Through you, Chair. Through the Chair. Um, the application that we received for the expression of interest was uh, quite scored lowly because it wasn't a strong application, didn't meet the criteria well, didn't provide sufficient detail, um, and uh, didn't address what we we're looking for out of the for the program priorities for this funding. But also at the same time, they had not achieved the outcomes that we were pre we had already funded them for. Um, we had requested so many times to have information provided on how they were achieving the outcomes we already were funding them for. And so they kind of failed that test on both of those, existing funding and the application quality. So in the um, email I received, um, 
today. I'm just trying to dig up the, um, the email. It did reference that they didn't um, close off their previous application correctly. So is yes. that why we don't have that information? Or? So they're required to provide uh, an annual progress report for three year grant fund funded mm -hmm. organisations. Um, it's due at the end of July. Um, it took more than four requests to get information which, which was received in February. Um, we did not release, we hadn't received sufficient information from them to release the 18-19 grant until late March, um, well into the financial year. And um, so they, at the time of assessing their application, they were in breach of the existing funding agreement with them. Um, and just the last question, um, I mean, do we take into account that organisations potentially this size may not have the resource um, or there, there isn't that, you know, hand holding, I guess, exercise because, you know, they're operating on, you know, very, very thin budgets. Is that the reasoning to why that there's been delays or do you think there are other reasons to why this has occurred? Through the chair. I can't speak to the reasons why they don't provide the information requested, but I was I made several offers to meet with them to walk through what our requirements were, um, to uh, take phone calls and was available to have those discussions. Also was available to have discussions about their application in the lead up um, and put all of that in writing many times. They did not take up that opportunity and hence the, um, the result. So just the last one, sorry, I did say that was the last one there, Chair, but uh, the acquittal report that we did, did we end up receiving an acquittal report and are we satisfied with that acquittal report or do you think we still did not meet the standards of the funding arrangement? It did not meet the standards. Uh, look, I'm, I'm happy to listen to the debate. I'm a little bit reluctant to keep supporting it, but um, I'm, I'm happy to listen to the debate. Um, no, you've spoken. I just want to ask a question. Oh, yeah. You can do it when I sum up one. Yep. Oh, you can do it now if you want to ask a question. I just wanted to know how long has the City of Adelaide had a, a relationship with the Adelaide um, Day Centre? Oh, I I'm not, uh, someone else might know. Yeah, it's four decades. Four decades. 40 years? Uh, does anyone else wish to speak to this? Lord Mayor. I have a follow-up question to that then, um, Chair. If it's been 40 years, is this the first time they've been in breach of what the requirement is in terms of delivering on? So my understanding is they've delivered on, they haven't delivered on what they were funded for and they haven't acquitted the grant. Is that right? So it's those two things and their application wasn't very good. But has that happened previously? Yes, um, I, I did do some background research. I went back through about five or six years um, worth of uh, reporting and it had been consistently weak, but um, administration had effectively sort of accepted it. Um, but uh, there wasn't a great deal of um, strength in a long history of um, their performance. And the second question is, if we were to support um, the 35,000 as per Councillor Singh's um, amendment, um, what is it that they would look to deliver? What was in their application that, that this would go towards? Um, their uh, expression of interest was to continue delivering the same program. Um, which was a range of services based at their um, operational headquarters as we received the application that I assessed. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Before going back to the mover, I might speak for a moment. Um, look, this organisation has been uh, working hand in hand with the City of Adelaide since the 1970s. Um, it is unquestionably one of the most senior services in the city, providing support to not only homeless but vulnerable people. It delivers services to something uh, in the order of hundreds of people every year, about 25% of whom are homeless, and with whom the service makes contact through its soup kitchen, um, which is provisioned by um, the Adelaide Day Centre going to markets and bakeries and other places in the city to collect goods to make those soups to provide to the homeless. It represents a, a contact point, a point where people are able to be brought in to contact with services 
and ultimately um, taken off the streets and provided not only with housing, but in cases where people are already in difficult uh, circumstances, that is to say they are vulnerable because they don't have permanent housing or they have inadequate housing, they're able to support them to ensure that they don't end up back on the streets. Now, the soup kitchen that uh, uh, Rob referred to uh, has been serving between 70 and 80 people a night in recent weeks. Um, and indeed, uh, on the night that uh, Councillor Hyde moved his motion declaring a crisis for homelessness, they were there. They were there uh, providing soup and provisions to 60 or 70 people uh, and ensuring that they were diverted to areas that could ensure that they were helped. Um, now, I understand, and so do they, that their processes uh, for completing paperwork are not great. It is, after all, a volunteer agency run by several nuns and volunteers. Uh, it is not something that they specialise in. Uh, and I fear that we need to be mindful that if the process becomes more important than the outcome, then we've made a big mistake. For $35,000 a year, um, I feel sure that we're getting value for money. And what's more, people who are homeless, vulnerable or in need are being directed to the services they need. I don't see how we can't support this, having already committed to the cause of homelessness through a range of measures, including substantial funding for the Zero Homelessness Project uh, and declared a uh, homelessness crisis in the city. I would urge everyone to support this. Thank you, Chair. I, I can only echo um, your uh, wise comments. I, I completely endorse what you've said. Um, you know, Council has had a long-term association with this organisation, as you've said, 40 years. Um, and in my mind, it's a vital service in our city. And um, it's a service that's really unique to the city of Adelaide. Um, any councillors that haven't had the opportunity to meet with Sister Janet Mead and her niece um, Joyce, I'd really encourage you to do so because they're two really wonderful, inspiring women who've um, devoted their lives to doing good work in the community. And um, if you do go down to the day centre, you'll see firsthand the impact that that has had. What is in effect transformative impact on vulnerable people in our city? Because this isn't an organisation that simply provides people with a roof over their head, which we know is vitally important, but it also gives people dignity in terms of opportunities to work in community gardens, develop craft, undertake artwork, um, it, there's a, a really a nourishing of the soul which doesn't happen in a lot of organisations and I see that as being really important in terms of building communities and also breaking down stigma in our community in terms of how homeless people are regarded. So um, it's a, an organisation that a lot of people rely on. This is a relatively small amount of money um, and whilst there may have been some administrative issues in terms of completing the paperwork satisfactorily, I'm hoping that councillors will support this noting that for years two and three uh, they do need to meet the criteria and um, I'd certainly be expecting them to work closely with administration to make sure that their applications in the future are at the right standard. But to cut this off for this year, um, particularly winter when we have declared a, um, a homelessness emergency a crisis, rather a homelessness crisis, I think would um, send the wrong message and, and be out of step with the focus that council has put on this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, now, uh, I'll put that to the vote. Uh, those in favour? Those against? That uh, amendment is carried. Um, now, um, let's move now to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is a waste management services briefing. Um, and Clinton's going to start uh, talking about rubbish now. Yeah. I said the rubbish. 
three each here. Uh, thank you. Perhaps if you just wait a moment. <laughs> That is concerning though, because it might not just be paperwork, like it might actually not be. Okay, um, uh, let's resume. And do I need to excuse the Lord Mayor from the room? Not yet. She advised me she's leaving shortly. Clinton. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, just wanted to take the opportunity to, first of all, everybody knows Tracy Dorber, um, but some of you may not know Gary Herdigen. Uh, Gary is our Associate Director for Public Realm down at the depot at Miley. So for those that aren't aware of Gary's work, that's what he's currently doing. Um, just a, a quick intro to this um, presentation. Um, following our last quarterly procurement update to Council, um, we gave uh, an undertaking, the CEO gave an undertaking to bring additional information back to um, Council around our waste services tender. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, as part of that, we also were asked to bring back information regarding uh, motions um, from Council that relate to waste services. So that's what we're here to present tonight. I just wanted to confirm um, we are commencing work on waste um, policy and waste strategy. So I just wanted to give comfort to elected members that um, there will be several opportunities and several workshops um, in the upcoming months to talk about policy and strategy and get um, detailed engagement from elected members on that particular topic. Um, so if there's any concerns, I can confirm that that is the process going forward. Um, over to our presenters. Um, um, it's already been explained why we're, we're here this evening, which is good fun. Um, so I'll just get straight into it. Um, the, and on, the notice of, on the notice of motion, I think there's a handout that was going to go around. Um, hopefully, we'll get that down to you if it hasn't gone around as yet. Has everyone yeah. got the paper here that's yeah. distributed? Okay. Yes? Yeah, except Councillor Hart. Fantastic. No. Cover, cover that off first. Okay. Please resume. Sorry. Thank you. Um, just uh, so while we're while we're here, um, the, the part of the um, part of the report that went to council some weeks ago regarding the procurement. Um, on this particular issue being the waste tender through Council Solutions. Um, Council Solutions, and I'm, I'm assuming everyone's familiar with Council Solutions, so um, it's a number of council, a collaborative of a number of councils that are going out to tender to um, get basically volume discounts on services for councils. Um, late last year, the um, Council Solutions and all the participating councils went through a submission process, the ACCC, which was approved, and they moved forward to go to tender. Uh, so Council Solutions are, in this particular instance, are working with the City of Adelaide, City of Charles Sturt, City of Marion, City of Port Adelaide Enfield, who are the participating councils in this particular tender. And the, the strategy objectives include lower costs, increased services, um, for the participating councils to improve their purchasing power by combining uh, their volumes. And uh, at the end of that, the, the actual award will be subject to council's approval uh, in the coming weeks. It's broken into three um, sections, the, the tender. There's re three requested tenders. RFT one is for the collection. Um, which is all our, our domestic waste, our recyclables and organics through the three bin system, which is generally the, um, the domestic collection. Um, but also there are components of that where we do do business collection through that same process, but they only have two streams collected. Uh, the RFT2 is the processing uh, tender. Uh, and it's, as, it's, as it indicates, uh, processing residual waste Commingled recyclables and food and organics. And RFT3 is the ancillary services, 
bulk bin tarred waste, um, which are the bulk bins sit within our medium density and high density areas, and the hard waste is an on call process provided by the contractors. Um, what we've provided here is a bit of information with our, our volumes and some of the service standards that are current um, across the city. Uh, and the current contractual arrangement expires on 30th of June 2019. Uh, the, we're using one available right of renewal, um, which will bring those services to the 30th of June 2020, which is um, set up basically to try and co-terminate with a proposed tender that um, we'll present to you within a few weeks. Um, anyway, I'll, those are the, the tonnages, the number of services we provide. Just for clarity, the curbside domestic collection and the curbside business waste collection, the sum is, is 10,800 there. Um, that's the, the total of those collections. And similarly with curbside domestic recycling and business recycling, uh, there's about 10,200 10, collections across the city. And the uh, organics is a, is a single stream. Um, the RFT2 is the processing tender. So um, there's a number of um, products there. The domestic waste is being uh, processed currently by Clean Away Trans Pacific. Uh, it's it is as it is, the, the total volume goes to that provider. Uh, Commingle recycling uh, currently by uh, Northern Area Waste Management Authority, I should say. Um, and we're proposing to send that to Visi Recycling from the 1st of July for a period. Jeffrey's uh, Organics will be taking the, the organics products. So the current contracts for those, uh, one's been extended, the domestic waste collection has already been extended. Uh, we're currently negotiating a short-term contract, which just I've indicated we'll get busy uh, from 1st July. The collection of food organics expires in November 2019, and we'll, um, we're using one available right of renewal to extend that to align with the new council solutions contract if it's approved um, in the coming weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. Ancillary services are those services which are outside of your normal collection and disposal. Now the hard waste collection service and the 660 litre bin, the high density streams that get collected from our medium and high density properties. Uh, the current contract for bulk bins uh, and hard waste are both expiring on the 30th of June this year, um, next week in fact, and um, we're using our right of renewal for 12 months to co-terminate with all our other contracts. And next steps, so where we're, where we're heading, um, the tender status, the negotiations being undertaken. We've got um, a number of tenders have been assessed and being assessed through council solutions, the collaborative across the councils. The data and motion panels and provide a recommendation for endorsement uh, we'll seek approval from the councils on a work of contract. That report should be with, with council by the end of June. Uh, if we're awarded the services, if awarded the services commence 1st of July 2020, all current contracts have been extended uh, to co terminate for that start date. And the process um, will allow us an uninterrupted continuation of the, of the waste service, of the essential waste services we currently provide. The waste management policy and strategy will be developed with council uh, and should not be at all affected by this process. That. That's it. You're in this lesson. <laughs> okay, are you going to speak, Tracy? Or? Uh, no, no, I'll take any questions. Okay. Um, are there any questions? It is a workshop, so go for it. Oh, okay. It's a presentation, so restrain yourselves. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. Thank you. Look, I, ha I have a question um, in relation to business curbside collection and uh, curbside recycling for business. Uh, we know that the service for um, 
curbside collection for residents is about 7,000. Um, and according to the figures there, uh, for business, it's 3,600. Um, what is that as a percentage of businesses in the city, potentially, who might receive that service? Would it be 5,000, 10,000, 11,000? Um, I'd, I'd have to take them on notice. I, I don't actually have that answer, but if take them on notice. But, but it does represent just a fraction, not the total number. Uh, yes, it would not be. Um, through the chair, it would not be the complete collection of all, all businesses. And is it so that the people who receive uh, business collection are the recipients of what are grandfathered arrangements? That is to say, when businesses close and move on, a new one moves in, the service terminates. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, the, the actual um, process uh, with the business bins, if, if a business uh, doesn't generate more waste than a, a property of a, a residential property, and it's a, a rate, rateable property, it's a rate payer, then we provide a single service to that property. So that's only for a uh, red littered residual waste bin and a yellow littered recycling bin. Um, that's across the board. But if, once the waste volumes get much higher than that, they need to go to a commercial arrangement. And when it comes to the organic bin, is that service provided to uh, business rate payers as well? And if so, what are the exclusions? Yes. The uh, green bins. Uh, yes, it's it's provided, uh, organics I should say, organics is not provided to businesses, organics is only provided to residential problems. Well, look, I, I know others want to speak. I, I, uh, for my part, I find it puzzling still that we do not provide the same service to business rate payers that we provide to residential rate payers. Um, and it's even more puzzling when uh, the city does make money out of organics and has made money in the past out of recyclables, that is the yellow bin. Um, uh, landfill, of course, is another matter that does cost us. Um, and uh, I appreciate that we're up to tender, but what we're up to tender for is a limited continuation of a limited service that includes all residential rate payers, but has a highly qualified approach. And this is the criticism of, the, of you or your colleagues, but I'm saying as a policy, we, um, we don't have an equitable approach to the collection of waste for business. And- Excuse um, me, Mr. Chair, is this a presentation not a workshop? I'm asking a question, I think. <laughs> so, so if, um, isn't that so? <laughs> so how do, how do we shift this debate then so we get it into a forum where we can start to talk about providing equitable service to business as we are to residents? Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, I'll just confirm that we are working to the current policy. So um, the procurement update we've given you tonight was to give you information to ensure um, that it's clear that we're trying to maintain essential waste services through this period of time. We do, however, have to work on our waste policy and our waste strategy. We have um, budget um, for developing the waste strategy, um, which is um, subject to the approval of council. We have that and we will be bringing workshops back to, count, uh, to committee um, to run through that and get engagement from elected members. So are you saying workshops in a committee will be the only way that we can start to change policy by asking administration uh, to do so before these changes um, these new contracts come in, or are we already too far down the track for that to happen? Because we have discussed this before. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, a um, couple of points. Um, one comment I think you made uh, regarding the uh, an income from from organics. Um, there is no income from organics; it comes at a cost, as does recycling now, and as does just varying costs. But there's no uh, income stream from any of those uh, provided. The other, um, the other comment is that the provision of these services under the tender 
um, will continue to provide that should should we through our strategy or through our other uh, decision making as part of further workshops choose to extend that or grow that these services will still be provided under the exist under the new tender we would just be expanding those because it's just an increase in the volume rather than an increase in the unit rate of provision of that service does that make sense Okay, so if if we wanted to revisit that, that would require a motion on the floor of council to revisit the policy. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Um, I think I think that work's already underway. Yeah. yeah, so we've already been given instruction from council to do that work, and I think what I heard Clinton say was that works underway. And what we're doing is running a bit of a parallel process where we need existing services to be maintained while. Um, the team come back to council and committee with what a new look waste services policy strategy could be. And so, is it not time? No. Yeah, that's what I thought of. Okay, I'm just puzzled because it, it, it uh, and by way of explanation to the room, it looked to me like we were entering into agreements in the near future as part of a tender process. So, so through the chair, um, the reason that we've came forward tonight is um, when we um, came forward with our upcoming procurement, we had the waste services contract as part of our current procurement that's going out to tender. Um, we need to enter into that contract, which is for our essential services that we need to continue delivering across the foreseeable years. So any change um, that results from the waste strategy wouldn't change that services that we're currently tendering for, they would still be in existence. So we still require them going forward. And that's the reason we need to enter into a new contract for those services. The reason there's such a lead time between now and the um, start of the contract day is that anyone that wins that contract needs to purchase capital items. So they need sufficient lead time to do that as well. It doesn't impact on any change that will come about from the waste strategy that's been worked on. If anything, there could be additional services, but it wouldn't change the essential services that we're currently delivering. Okay, Rob. Uh, question. And look, if this is not within the remit of the presentation, please um, let me know. But I thought it was an appropriate opportunity to ask um, while you're here. I saw recently some new technology that's being um, trialled, which is involving sort of see through bins which um, demonstrates you know, what people are throwing away. Um, and I understand is um, a way of encouraging... Oh, um, <laughs> is a, a way of encouraging smart, um, smart waste management practices because, of course, when you have a see-through bin, yeah, you encourage people to do their recycling and, and so on. I just wondered whether that was an idea that had been looked at and whether um, it's my understanding that it is leading to behavioural change in other um, cities around the world. Uh, through the chair, um, yes, there's a number of initiatives um, across waste collection that are, are relevant, I think, to different ways of doing it. One um, uh, a few weeks ago was, should, you know, should we provide 40 litre bins and smaller bins to restrict yeah. the amount? Those types of things, many initiatives, but I think they'll be considered in the waste strategy. Um, and I'll be working with the sustainability team in the, the preparation of the waste strategy from an operational and from a strategy perspective. So I think we're, um, and, I, and I might add, if I may, the email, the um, e-news that came out last week about composition audit, um, that is just so that we know what we currently do and what we currently have. It's not about any change to service or any of those types of things. It was just really to get some baseline data to be able to build from that to build the waste strategy. But, but there will be an opportunity to feed into those kind of ideas because I really Absolutely. think that's something worth looking at. Um, and my understanding from what I've read about this initiative is that it is actually driving behavioural change, which is what we need to do in terms of improving uh, recycling and appropriate waste management. In the city. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry, I was just talking to Cassie. Right. Um, 
So uh, the, 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 the service will be going to uh, smaller businesses. I take it just as, as I think what you're doing now, I'm just trying to understand where you, where, where, you know, what is in the remit, is that uh, it'll be smaller businesses that will just generate uh, on a smaller amounts of, like with the organic waste or with, say, with uh, um, you know, the recycling and all the rest of it. It doesn't have anything to do with, it, obviously, a certain size or a business that's going and that has a bit more scale. So that's obviously that'll sit outside what you're looking at collecting. Is that correct? Or um, through the chair, um, yes. The current tender is is, is about what we currently do, uh, and it's about those smaller businesses that have smaller uh, waste volumes. It's only provided for residual red red litter bins and uh, recyclables. The organics aren't collected, but um, into the future we'll we'll have to look have a look at that. But if the quanti quantities get much larger, it becomes a commercial quantity and requires a whole different level of treatment um, and collection obviously by a commercial contractor. Alex. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, first up, just for the benefit of the oncoming strategy, I want to flag that I agree with Rob's idea. I think we should um, rubbish shame people into action. Um, I don't often think that's a headline, rather. I, I don't often think that's a way to go about achieving behavioural change, but I think in this, uh, this instance, it is justifiable. Um, uh, one, one thing leads on from that, um, something that a ratepayer asked me a while ago. Um, do we have people that do spot checks and audits on recycling just to see that people are putting the right things in the right bins and that sort of stuff? Or is this rate paid? This rate paid just have someone going through their bin and complaining to them about what they put in it? Uh, through the chair, um, we do have, um, Michelle's nodding, but uh, we do have some level of um, inspection, I believe. But often you do get people going through recycling bins to collect the cans and those types of things and people are quite emotive about that oh no so this person was adamant that they represented they were from the city of adelaide and, and complained or well, they had a go at them because they weren't putting the right things oh, i'm not aware of the process where where that would happen in this council i know in other councils the bins aren't tagged okay. and refuse collection mm -hmm. uh, and the only other area that could happen is if a waste truck driver was to see excessive recycle or excessive contamination in a recycling bin, yeah. that driver would be required to pull up, um, flag or tag that bin or remove, and ask the person to remove that problem yeah. before we collect that bin. Yeah, I didn't give it much credence at the time, which is why I didn't follow up, I must confess. But I see um, just deferring to Michelle there. Is there anyone in the sustainability outfit that does those sorts of inspections? Or? Sure. Sure. Um, so through the chair, um, there has um, at times, not recently, but we certainly have at times um, uh, undertake work with KESA, where we actually use little cards um, and they've got you know green smiley faces, you're doing the right thing, and then you know yellow cards that say, oh, did you know you could put this in that bin? Um, but they don't normally involve personal interaction. Interaction. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the, so they inspect what's in the recycling and leave something in the letterbox or stuff. Um, so it's tag on their bin. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you do rubbish shame people a little bit already. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Or is that like a report card? Yeah. Okay. All right. No, no, cool. That, that clears that up for me um, and that will uh, feed into the discussion, I'm sure. Um, uh, just a question again on the businesses. I wasn't clear. Um, so when once they reach, a, let's call it a commercial volume of waste, do we then take their, their uh, a sort of council residential bin away from them, bins away from them, or do they keep that and also get a larger bin? <coughs> So, um, so through the, the chair, um, so the operating guideline that we have um, uh, does say when you get to a certain size um, that you need to transfer over and the policy does say that um, at that time you you would um, have that been taken back from you. In, in practice, probably mm. over the years, that has been a, a variable experience. Yeah, that's just what I've noticed because it gets to a point, I guess, when they enter into their own contractual relationship with the rubbish um, collector and, and but we don't necessarily follow up, take the away. Not that I'm that concerned about it, but just want to clarify. Thank you. Can I, sorry, I just want to 
Yep. Yeah. So I just want to be clear. Sorry, did you say that we're going to do? Uh, I understand we're going to have further workshops to discuss mm -hmm. about the businesses and ways forward. The whole strategy. The whole strategy. Through the chair, um, there'll be a whole process of how we, how how council believes we should engage with the community uh, and what services perhaps the community want to want provided, and there'll be a full engagement strategy. I think it's part of that. Um, strategy work that we're doing and yes there'll be an opportunity for the councils to workshop um, all those factors from a waste perspective. Any other questions? Anyone want to speak to rubbish shaming? Yeah. <laughs> we'll work together on mm. <laughs> If I give you my address will you promise not to shame me? <laughs> you get a smiley face. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay, let's move now to the uh, the next matter, which is council members discussion forum items, which I have to confess in my whole time of chairing these meetings, I've never really understood. Um, does anyone want to raise a discussion forum item? No, you don't understand either, so that's good. All right, let's move to exclusion. Through the chair, um, this item was suggested as part of the government's restructure and is a leftover from the pre previous government structure. So indeed, council members can raise any items uh, of discussion. This could be on agenda items to bring forward or agenda items to bring in um, or a question on a particular topic. Um, so it's your opportunity to use that for that purpose. Is it under debate or is it just It's just informal, informal discussion. Ah, this is informal discussion. You'd like to have one on clear rubbish bins? No, I, I just want to let members know I won't be taking advantage of it today, but strap yourselves in. I will next time. Part of the newsstand anymore? Okay, let's move forward. Uh, item seven is an exclusion um, and it is um, for the matter 8.1 funding matter, which sounds secretive, um, to be heard in confidence and 8.2 2019-20 integrated business plan, the secret bits. Um, can I have a mover, moved by Aman, seconded by Anne, um, those in favour uh, of 8.1, that is. Those in favour of 8.1? <coughs> okay, that's, uh, oh, those against, yes, those against. Um, that's carried despite uh, um, the votes against. 8.2, uh, uh, those in favour? Second, sorry. Second, Franz. Okay. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Okay. Um, members of.
Um, I look forward to the next time that I have the opportunity. Thank you for your service, Councillor. I, uh, I declare this meeting uh, closed. Well done, Phil. Chair, well, it's good meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Went out on a high. <laughs> Thank you.